Good morning, colleagues. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to play a small role in your important conference today, and it does look a, a fantastic agenda for the day as a whole. Um, I want to talk about five things, I think, in the time I have available. I want to talk about whether we are making any progress in rebalancing the UK economy to a more sustainable economic model. I want to talk about political risk and what that may mean for business. And then I want to <coughs> focus on where I think that pinches with the environment debate. And I'm going to suggest that it really pinches on energy policy and how we decarbonize energy whilst keeping, one, the lights on, and two, the costs at a competitive level. And then, given the politics, James, are pretty gloomy, I want to end on a more upbeat note and focus on two things that I think we collectively, but politicians and business leaders, can do. The first of those is international agreement and the roadmap to Paris. And then finally, and more what my constituency and Matthew, your constituency, can do, which is to come back to the issue of energy efficiency. So where are we on rebalancing the economy? Well, lots of commentators say we haven't made very much progress. I disagree. I think we are making slow but steady progress. But it's going to take time because we got it so fundamentally wrong in the fool's paradise of the decade of growth that led up to 2008 that weaning ourselves off the old model of debt-driven consumption by households and state and getting back to a model where consumption sits in more even balance with business investment, government investment and trade is a very difficult process to get right. But we are making slow progress. Because it's slow, we can't see too much of it yet. And in that context, I'd like to point you to what's happened to growth in 2014. Politicians tell us with alacrity that we'll have the fastest growth of any of the advanced economies. It's pretty much cooked now, so not much can go wrong, touch wood, between now and Christmas. We will have grown this year by at least, if not slightly, over 3% of GDP. But the important point is that somewhere over 40% of that GDP growth this year has actually come from business investment. Whereas last year, when we grew by 1.7% of GDP, almost all of it, certainly over 1.3%, the only reason I can't be exact is the ONS can never make their mind up where the statistics are for at least a 10-year period. Vast majority of that growth last year, 1.3% of 1.7%, came from consumption. So we've shifted between 2013 and 2014, not only to a higher growth model, but a growth model which I would suggest is more organic. When I was in Davos in January this year, I could feel that global CEOs were having conversations with each other, which was all about this was the year they were going to try and do something about capital spending. They were talking about moving from OPEX to CAPEX. And if enough global CEOs say that on top of a Swiss mountain, by the time they get back to their company headquarters, something different happens. And business investment has turned on a sixpence this year. And it's phenomenally powerful because it's business investment that will deliver, Matthew, your national infrastructure plan. It's predominantly private sector capital leveraged for public good that replaces the fact that the taxpayer can no longer do that heavy lifting and that for George Osborne tomorrow in the autumn statement, Mother Hubbard's cupboard is largely empty. So I am quite optimistic about the prospects for the economy. Clearly, there's some pretty big headwinds out there. And the biggest headwind is that our economy is growing so much faster than most of the other advanced economies. I'm not quite as worried as some commentators about global slowdown. China might slow from 7 to 6. Wow. It's not going to fall over, I don't believe. My bigger worry, frankly, is closer to home. The Eurozone could do some damage to the UK economy. That headwind is a principal downside risk. But except to the extent that it's slowing down forward order books on manufacturers, it's not evident yet that it's particularly pernicious on the UK economy, although we've got it very much on the watch list. 
What has been done in public policy, before I get depressed about the politics, to actually help with that economic model? Well, something is now in vogue that three years ago, frankly, I wasn't allowed to speak about anywhere near the Palace of Westminster, and that's industrial policy. Three years ago, if I talked about industrial policy in the corridors of Westminster, men in white coats arrived to take me away. <laughs> because in the post-Thatcher world, it was just no-go area. They thought I was talking about British Leyland, they thought I was talking about Rod Red Robbo, and they thought I was talking about politicians picking winners. And nobody across the political spectrum wanted anything to do with it. Three years later, there has been a quiet revolution. We have re-established the notion that government and business need to work together. I would suggest business-led, with politicians listen patiently in a corner until they can identify something useful they can do, instead of jumping in with both feet. But I do believe we now have the sense that government and business need to work together in an advanced industrial economy to find ways in which private capital can be used for public good and public interventions can help the private sector deliver for the benefit of all. If you look at the renaissance of the UK automotive sector or the reshoring of parts of our supply chain in aerospace or the way everybody is now getting behind creative industries as one of our most dynamic sectors, you begin to see the fruits of that. I think there is one essential point, though. The UK cannot be good at everything. In industrial strategy, we need to identify no more than half a dozen principal sectors, and I've already chosen three, so that doesn't leave me many more, and not pretend that we can sell across the world with everything all of the time. I'm a historian by background. I've got an interest in military history. It's the difference between the Eisenhower approach to winning the war, which is after D-Day you advance on all fronts all the time with equal force, and the Montgomery view that you have a spearhead heading for Berlin. It is still a historical controversy 70 years later. My view of industrial strategy is pick the sectors that we're still good at and back them, back the winning technologies and the winning capabilities. Don't choose winning companies. Nobody's any good at that. And then you can begin to multiply. And I think the way industrial strategy has got behind our new growth model is already producing dividends. I'm in the FT today talking about growing a British Mittelstand. That is another theme I could bore for Britain on, but I haven't got time. Where sits your interests in that? Well, I think there are sectors where we stand a chance to compete in the world, and there are cross-cutting technologies and capabilities. And I think Britain's environmental capabilities, our ability to leverage green growth, is a cross-cutting theme that sits across the sectors where we stand a chance of punching above our weight. And that leads me to, I hope, an upbeat message, Matthew, in relation to that slide about only 3% of people thinking the environment is an important issue when 28% of people think immigration is an important issue. It explains, and I now understand it, why I spent 58 of the 60 hours I worked last week working on immigration policy, not on environment policy. But actually, we shouldn't get too depressed about this. It's not surprising with the heart attack that the UK and world economy had in 2008 that people are primarily focused on economic growth, on unemployment, and on the consequences of not feeling comfortable in their skin, they get very uptight about immigration. In that context, those figures are not surprising. What is interesting is that business wasn't the first group in society to realize that the environment was important, and I wouldn't claim they were. It was green groups who were the first groups. It wasn't politicians. It was activists. But business eventually got it. And when business got it, the difference between business and the politicians is that when times get tough, business doesn't lose it. Business has stuck with it quietly. So all through that period from 2008, the evidence is CBI's green credentials. It's not for me 
to talk about CBI's green credentials. But colleagues in the green movement do say they're interested that CBI is still out there talking about green growth and the fact they are not alternatives, they are symbiotic. I have a mandate from my 190,000 corporate members, say it again, 190,000 corporate members, to talk about green growth because they got it before the crash. They started putting in place plans to use the market, to use technology, to use innovation, to enable them to make money, because that's what entrepreneurs like you do, out of doing the right thing for society, and there's no conflict between that. And they didn't abandon and drop those plans simply because times got tough. So as we move now into economic recovery, I don't talk about environmental industries, and I don't talk about green jobs, because frankly, we need the whole economy to be an environmental industry, and we need all jobs to be green jobs. And that's a much better definition. If an insurance company across the road is selling green insurance policies, then we're beginning to make progress on greening the economy in a way that business is in the vanguard of. And I'm therefore relatively optimistic about that situation. So that's where I am on the economy. Briefly then, the politics. Well, the politics are tricky. Welcome to democracy. The politics are going to be tricky through to the 7th of May. Of May. Welcome to general election periods. The challenge, I think, is the dampening effect of the cocktail of political risk we face on that recharged, supercharged, hopefully green economy. Just a word generally, and then a word specifically. We can always navigate political risk. I'd much rather be faced by political risks than an economy that's got no growth in it. If you've got demand, you'll find a way of working with politicians. If you haven't got any commercial demand, what's the point? The challenge, I think, is I cannot ever in my very long CBI career, now 32 years, I'm afraid, I can't remember a moment when the cocktail of political risk had so many different elements. In the 1951 election, the two main parties, as you may have seen, because it's a well-known fact, got 98% of the votes. The Liberals got the rest. This election, the two main parties will probably get 60% of the vote. We have become more continental European. None of us know who's going to win the election because it will come down to a small number of votes in a small number of constituencies and the arithmetic of what coalition can be put together. Look at what happened in Berlin this year when Chancellor Merkel had the most emphatic electoral victory in post-war German history and ended up in a weaker position because the Liberals didn't get 5% and were thrown out of the Bundestag. So what will happen is entirely unpredictable. But the real problem is that that political cocktail of risk is bookended by two even more unpredictable bookends called referenda. A Scottish referendum that we thought was behind us, but many of us seem to have forgotten who actually won the referendum, and a European referendum which is undoubtedly ahead of us, I think irrespective of who wins the election, and which brings great uncertainty. So narrowing that uncertainty down to our area of interest, I think current political uncertainty is dampening business investment because most of the people I talk to, not in companies who want to invest, in the city who put the money into companies who want to invest, in this square mile, would say with current levels of political uncertainty about environment and energy policy, we'll just pause a bit longer before pressing the button. I agree with Matthew. I think the second political risk is inconsistency of policy. What your area of interest undoubtedly needs is certainty that straddles parliaments. You can't continually reverse views on renewables obligations, contracts for difference, capacity auctions, if you want people to invest. And then there's the third of the chilling factors, if you like, and this is a hardy perennial. For an island that's well populated with a limited land mass, this is always going to be a problem, and that's the planning system. I don't think the planning system will ever go away as a constraint on investment, but it's undoubtedly one at the moment. 
So that's my cocktail of political risk, but the overwhelming message I'd like to give there is an upbeat one. What does this mean to our common debate? Well, as long as I've been in this area of policy, and as James said, I was appointed the CBI's first director of the environment in 1991. We've been struggling to exemplify and illustrate what we mean by sustainable development. And we always will be. It's one of those issues on which you never actually reach the end of the journey. But I'd illustrate it currently with the issue of energy and the environment. Because I've already said I think energy investment is challenged. And it's challenged because there's a holy trinity of issues which I think are not easy to reconcile. Some people talk about it as a trilemma. I don't like that phrase. I'm more upbeat about this. We have a holy trinity or a triangulation of issues which are hard but not impossible to reconcile. So for as long as we, we've all been working together, we've been trying to decarbonize our energy in order to achieve our low carbon ambitions and targets. But more recently, what has come into play is an equally significant concern about security of supply, about literally keeping the lights on. And more recently, even than that, we've got the concern about doing this at competitive cost. My area, of course, is cost to business, and I'm particularly focused on energy-efficient industries. Politically, as we saw in the most recent budgets and autumn statements, this is the concern about costs to households. And sustainable development surely means we have to find the highest common factor between those three points of triangulation. Because I bow to no one in my commitment to green growth. But I'm not going to have green growth that causes our energy-intensive industries to shut down in this part of the world, but pollute in another part of the world. There is no inconsistency between having a high enough price of carbon to generate the investment required to decarbonize our electricity and exempting the industries that are driving every day of the week for energy efficiency because they have to, because cost is everything, but simply can't operate without using energy. And on the issue of keeping the lights on, the investments we need to provide low carbon energy are the same investments we need to keep the lights on. It's just being a bit pragmatic about which energy sources we need in the short term and how you transition to which energy sources you need in the long term. I've just make, made it sound not too difficult, haven't I? But actually at the moment, that triangulation is completely stuck. And I have every sympathy with colleagues in deck who are trying to resolve that as we speak. And we'll see the fruits of a capacity auction, which is the illustration, the exemplification of that challenge. So my two points of optimism, and I think, Matthew, I'll just throw them out as points of optimism. I was really chuffed with the October European Council. I thought we ended up with an agreement, 40% reduction across Europe by 2030, that to me looked elusive. I also felt we did the right thing in how we deliver for that by sticking with a single binding target, because I'm a great believer looking at the challenges we've had in the last 20 years on European and global environmental policy with micromanagement. Countries and companies need the flexibility to do the right thing as long as we know where we're heading, which is why the one binding target is important. With that behind us, and with the renewed commitment from President Obama and the encouraging signs from China, I think Paris might just actually do something useful. And I've always wanted, it's been the holy grail that's always been slightly out of touch, to get to a global agreement. And finally, what can you do? What can I do? What can we do in our own premises on our own patch? When CBI got on the road to Damascus, the sore moment of recognizing that green and growth were the same thing, they were not alternatives. We were the first in the UK to work with McKinsey's 
on the famous McKinsey's cost curve. You'll find that first in a CBI report. And what that McKin McKinsey's cost curve told us then and what it tells us now is that you focus on the left-hand side of the curve. Because on the left-hand side of the McKinsey's cost curve, you find the low-hanging fruit that we should simply do before we do everything else. On the right-hand side of the cost curve, there are really exciting big cost items like carbon capture and storage. Fantastic if we ever get there. On the left-hand side of the cost curve is the hardy perennial, the micro-actions of energy efficiency. And it really frustrates me, going into the election, that the most obvious thing for us all to do in our households, and I live in an old cottage that doesn't have cavities, so I'm challenged, and in our businesses, why don't we get the politicians to help us focus on a major national drive on energy efficiency if we want to answer the public's concern as to how you do the right thing about the environment without it breaking the bank. Thank you very much.